this is pretty much bringing us to our wedding now because it's now 11 o'clock. I have a big church tower bell over there and it says, let's start. So welcome, all of you, everybody, and my speakers of the day. My name is Rainer McEady. I work for the Institute for Combat Intelligence and this is of course one of my fun sessions of my jobs, i.e. I have two charming interview partners with me and we're tackling, tackling a wonderful topic and this is competitive and market intelligence, past, present and future. Wow, so this already is quite ambitious and I hope we have some fun and we have, we have some insights for you guys out there. And of course, it's not only one directional, i.e. us talking and you just listening. No, we have a chat function, which you should find on your GoToMeeting uh, panel. That's for you to really type in some questions, comments, hopefully nice ones, and then of course we'll take it from there. But let's start with a quick introduction. So we have our speakers and they should provide a bit of background information i.e. giving us a kind of, okay, where do they come from and how come that they are sitting in a webinar session like that? So, first one, Roland, please. Yeah, welcome everybody and uh, I'm Roland Heger, a professor at ESP Business School here in Reutling, at Reutling University and uh, well, I'm doing now for 20 years uh, uh, research uh, and um, analysis on competitive intelligence. Unfortunately, naturally, we cannot publish much about it because it's usually for private businesses. And um, I, I did that already um, when I was at Kodak and, uh, well, even even KPMG, I did part of it. So um, long time background and I enjoy it uh, every time again. Great. And you heard the name, Kodak. We'll come back to that. I'll pick on you about this company, of course. Eric, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Rainer, for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for listening in. My name is Eric Elgsma. I work with Friesland Campina in the Netherlands, um, currently head of strategy of strategic analysis for uh, our businesses in the, the area of cheese, butter, and milk powder worldwide. And in that role, um, about 20 years, 25 years of experience in say what we call market intelligence, market analysis, and lately also quantitative predictive analysis, which I will elaborate on in more detail in the Bad Neuheim conference. Uh, conference. And uh, at the moment, um, mainly responsible for strategic analysis for the chief business. Okay, so this sounds like a good mix of people, of backgrounds. Obviously, we're around for some time, and this, of course, gives us some authority in terms of, well, let's talk about this very, say, life cycle of competitive market intelligence. Here I picked the schematic uh, um, timeline, which is based on Gartner's hype cycle. Remember, Gartner IT company had this idea of technologies as well as topics, issues, having a certain life cycle over time, having these six distinct phases as discussed here. So how can we apply that to our notion of competitive market intelligence over the years? My question for you is, when do you think we started with this notion? There must have been a hype, I guess. I guess you can all agree on that. And by the way, where are we for today? And then, of course, what's next, I use the future of Give us, let's share some ideas of this kind of uh, positioning exercise here. Please. Well, okay, yeah, well, well, then I'll begin. Okay, um, well, I, I'm usually more in the uh, B2B uh, business environment and uh, I can basically see two cycles. Um, one is actually for the competitive intelligence uh, area, the other for um, the technology, you know, that is now enabling more business intelligence, more even even artificial intelligence in that area. Uh, so when, when I look into these uh, uh, different phases, then, then I would say, you know, that the tech trigger really was uh, for CI in, in the 90s with basically alerts that you could set on 
select databases uh, like the Global Reporter, um, you know, usually that was only possible to be um, contracted on, you know, directly with, for example, Thomson uh, International, Thomson Corporation uh, at that time. Uh, and, and we at Kodak, for example, we, we contracted with them and uh, every 14 days or however, you know, you purchased it, uh, you could uh, see uh, the uh, uh, whole introduction, um, you know, of uh, products or uh, into certain markets and um, they analyze nearly a thousand newspapers, you know, from the Asahi Shimbun uh, to Naturally Times or whatever. Uh, published anything in English, you, you could also get uh, the original language uh, part. So, so that was the, the tech trigger at that times. You know, um, constructed with dialogue uh, because they were basically the ones we contracted with. In 2000, then um, I remember it uh, very well. I was uh, at the Infobase in Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt Mine, and uh, the business fair, and that was the first time. Right when they made that publicly available, you know, to basically everybody who pays. And uh, this public availability of these alerts enabled basically now everybody to uh, make these, uh, well, alerts, what are alerts? Um, basically canned search terms. And uh, they were put on the database and you can regularly, you know, basically uh, make them run. And um, after some time, you know, they gathered uh, the information and then it simply got distributed to you. That was cool because, well, I could, sitting in, in Stuttgart, I could basically see any introduction of a digital camera everywhere in the world. So that was cool. You know, in, in uh, Japan, in Hong Kong, in Thailand, in the US, in, in Japan, no matter where. So that you was see. actually... Yep, yes. If I, if I may jump in, using this kind of idea of the schematic uh, development over time, that must have meant that this was a kind of high expectations, but low outcome. Well, absolutely, absolutely. So there must have been a kind of downturn after that. When you said 2000 was this kind of peak, and then well, 2000 was the beginning uh, of public availability. Then peak probably 2003, four, something like that, and okay. in 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 2007, eight, you know, you saw that um, it, it was already going down because uh, um, many things could not be delivered. <laughs> Today we do have a better software system, we have a, a much more filled internet, we have uh, um, you know, um, a lot more possibilities. But uh, at that time, for example, in 2007, Reuters and Thomson merged because they had the problem. They saw, wow, what, what can we do? How can we... Um, uh, really make make more money. How can we keep the growth? And they couldn't keep it. Even you know the merger in 2011, they already said, well, probably fail, um, because uh, we we could not really uh, um, well um, stand up to the expectations uh, that the merger you know raised. Money over there. So, so where we, are we now? Sort of still in this valley of tears, or are we um, starting with this I, kind I of the becoming the, productive the valley and of tears money? Was really I think the Valley of Tears was really um, uh, in, in, well, after 2011, um, 12, 13 or something. And we really went a little bit through because um, now with, uh, well, Google and, you know, publicly available um, search engines bringing, you know, different types of information. But uh, a lot of what uh, the majority needs are leads, creation, product information and so on. Um, basically being available and being searchable also, you know, uh, very well. Um, now created the possibility and prices coming down, you know, for example, for competitive information, monitoring uh, of markets and so on. Um, that actually created now a steady uh, increase in these uh, technologies, uh, in the processes, um, a lot of companies uh, installing not just business development departments, but CI um, uh, parts in there where they uh, systematically now uh, check the market. Uh, I just have a, a project with a large, a large uh, trailer for you. So but if I understand correctly, somehow now in this slope of enlightenment, so really we're bringing our act together and there should be more and more interest if this is somehow related to this curve. And of course, as we're gaining value in this discipline. 
Before we talk about the maybe system, maybe I Reiner, I can build on uh, Roland's yeah. point. When, when I look, at, yeah, when when I look at this, I think I think the first thing you need to do is to distinguish between two, I would say, quite distinct capabilities within the market or competitive intelligence field. The one being qualitative analysis, starting with individual snippets of news or, or individual, say, sources like new product launches, like competitive moves, like customer moves, etc. And all these qualitative snippets, these little pieces, are now indeed technologically, technologically supported in terms of web crawl, etc., to collect what you need for your future decision making. We have indeed, just as Roland said, moved along that direction, uh, starting our internal knowledge management system in this field in exactly the year 99. And then we started partly based on subscriptions, partly on own collection, partly on own build tools, and gradually moving to tools that we could buy to third parties. We're now having an internal knowledge management system where we only have one keyword, which is empowerment. We enable basically everyone that has a CristonCampina.com email address to access a continuously updated database that monitors, monitors, enables to monitor them what they need in the total business environment of our company worldwide. That's set one, and I believe that is in a mature phase. Set two, which is where we're now pioneering, is in predictive analytics, merging business intelligence from internal systems with data on the world around us, quantitative data, some of it being data on the past, some of it being data that has value for predicting the forecasting the future. And that to me is it now somewhere between stage one and two, because we're expecting the world. And the question is whether we'll get the world, whether we really get so much better than uh, we can't deliver up to the expectations that are out there now. But let's hope we we'll, won't see ourselves going down the hill in a few years' time so fast when the disappointment phase starts. For the time being, I'm still relatively upbeat on the possibilities of quantitative uh, predictive analytics, but we should overestimate uh, <clears throat> because in the end, no matter how good your forecast or analysis, if you don't get your acceptance with your management, you still have no better decision making. Which is per usual the kind of, do we meet expectations and have we been smart enough to uh, promise what we can really deliver afterwards. So uh, I agree. I mean, this is a, we are all pretty much in the same generation, I guess. I think we, we started somewhere in the 1970s, Michael Porter, competitor intelligence coming up. And then this big hype came in 90s, I guess. As you said, there was a big yeah. revolution going on. Information was available at your fingertips. Remember, this was a kind of uh, motto we had in these days, but not much coming out of that, or at least this discipline of CIMI, now looking back, well, 20 years now, was really not delivering, I thought, what they were expecting. And yes, there was a bit of a disappointment, I agree. Maybe overrated even. But now we're living in dynamic times and there's new software, new tools. You mentioned already predictive analysis and new passwords and of course artificial intelligence coming up every now and then. So the interesting perspective, but let's try to apply a little bit. And of course, I prepared a case study on this very um, discussion. Remember, yes, this is of course Kodak. And everybody in our call should of course remember Kodak, a company in the better base you see on the right hand side. Let me just highlight again, number of employees over time, right? So this is our time existence here is a share price. 81, this was, yes, Sony Nokiaka, the first sensor, as you know, for today, able to capture an image. A kind of revolution taking on because Kodak was all about, yeah, analog films, right? This was a big business, obviously, when processing and then printing came in. And suddenly, boom, you had a new technology and as you can see, it took them 20 plus years from 150,000 down to bankruptcy. 
2012, I think they started auction off the patents. So this was the day, these were the days, right? They had competitive technical intelligence, obviously on board. We you know Tim Kindler, he's uh, one of our fellows who wrote a nice article in hindsight uh, after he left. And uh, his claims, of course, knew it all. We've seen it coming. Impact of digital photography or digital technology in our business. So my question for you guys, I mean, <laughs> pretty much in this kind of slope that we discussed before, but what went wrong? And given that this was obviously a disruptive uh, technology emerging slowly over time, uh, what could they have done better or turn it to our days? If you were now in an industry in a situation like that, how would you avoid that something like that could happen to you, your industry? Give me some ideas. What are your clues? Let's apply. Yeah, Who's yeah, first? Yes, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so well, that hard to know, right? I, I was in with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, the management of uh, Kodak Germany in Edelfingen in Stuttgart, and um, I was working for the CEO. I was working for uh, the CFO, and um, I, I have a very specific view about this because at that time, that was exactly um, the time when things went wrong. And that was the time when you see the peak here uh, in in uh, um, here 90, 92, 93 uh, of the share price, and uh, uh, yeah, that's that's where where things went went uh, uh, very much wrong. Um, I have two lessons basically um, from that experience. One is um, well, basically forget the accountants. Um, at, at that time, I, I think uh, the, the killer of that was not George Fisher, uh, was not the technology, it was uh, Harry Kavitas, the CFO uh, at that time. And, and I think today he could not do that anymore. Uh, we are in different times, we have different uh, accounting measures, uh, ROA, we have uh, the balance scorecard, which at that time was still, you know, uh, being developed. Uh, the, the, the first articles in, in, in 1992, uh, 93, uh, the following, the book in 96. So uh, we were still using uh, only financials basically to evaluate um, uh, technology. And, and uh, the beginning of a technology naturally it doesn't make money. It, it's, it's a huge investment. And Harry Kavitas once said, you know, well, if the technology is, is far enough, we will buy it. We will buy it back. And I said, well. I mean, when, when we recognize that it's uh, uh, shooting through the ceiling, then others will recognize too. So we will not either not be able to buy back or um, we will simply be too late. So that's one of the reasons, one of the lessons I got. The other lesson is um, <clears throat> you always have to look for innovation and nurture it. And uh, I think Clayton Christensen here made a, a, a good thing also. You know, his book, uh, his dissertation and, and, and postdoc work being published in 1997. So also later, uh, that, uh, that uh, you, you cannot really um, easily do that in an environment, you know, what was the dilemma, where everything is optimized to your current technology. And for Kodak, that was the film. And so the film always got the development money and the digital did not get it. I, I mean, as I point, uh, uh, when when it was freed up, you know, the, the electronic filmmaking from the espionage satellites, you know, to being able to be used for consumer business or for, the, for general business, uh, Kodak was the first to license it. Now to whom? Well, to Fujifilm. <laughs> because they said, well, until this is good enough from a quality point or... Um, so how would you, would you change that? Well, don't make the accountants rule innovation. That's the first thing. And uh, second, um, do innovation um, really a little bit on the side. So, I mean, like Clayson Christensen's advice, you know, put it on, a, on an own company, you know, probably naturally 100% owned by you, but, but put it in a different company so that they are free and, and, and give them a budget, you know, that's, that's good enough. So that's basically my two advices, CI, um, and I would also even challenge um, 
that Kodak didn't uh, get the point of, of the technology because we were all the time talking about digital. What does that mean? And so on. But the, the, the heads in, in Rochester, they always said, well, but it's, it's not developed enough. And, and that is actually the financial point. That was the financial point. We, we had a lot of people leave. I mean, me, myself, I left in 97 because I said, well, no way to, to get through that. And, and I see how they kill the company. So I left, got a professor. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, that's an interesting you know, point. So, so yeah, I mean, turn it now 20 years into our presence, right? Yeah. So this is now the step about what could you do now sitting in a company like that? And there are many super tankers like that still around. And let me, how let, see, let, I, am I help you now? I mean, what are the tools, what are the kind of approaches, or even you indicate organizational issues that need well, to be Well, let me, let me uh, try to Very give much. you a completely different lens, uh, yeah. Reiner. When, when you look at this from a different lens, and it's applicable because it's optics, <laughs> so we use this lens of psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but if, consider you're in the meat business today and you see this vegetarian trend coming up the last thing you want is to believe that in 20 years time what happens to say that has happened to smoking 20 years before will happen to me in 20 years from now it's not an easy message to accept so you look in anything you see you look for things that confirm what you want to believe and the confirmation bias you will, will give you the warmth, even if it's a bit of wishful thinking. And I'm, I can't say where in 20 years time from now, 70% of the people will be vegetarians or 15, but I do know there is a particular <coughs> chance that in, uh, say, 20 years from now, 85% of the people in, say, Northwestern Europe will be vegetarian. That, that is a possibility. One of the ways SCI or strategic staff to consider such a future is to say, why not assume 85% of the people 20 years from now are vegetarian and try to trace back what do we need to believe, what do we need to see in what we call a pre-mortem analysis, what, do we, what does need to happen for that 85% of people being vegetarian 20 years from now. And the moment you start to identify, say, the steps that have to happen or the steps that need to be taken for that outcome, then you may also assess the probability of those steps and the sort of decision tree from today until 20 years from now. And those sort of strategic analysis, those sort of CI tools, I think are already at our disposal. We have the fortune that Clayton Christensen has helped us to understand that you're in the meat business, you're probably not going to be the one leading the vegetarian meat replacement business because of the internal lack of momentum that the meat business has to reinvent itself, and it's, it's valid across industries. So, so you have those, those insights, and what you really need is the receptiveness of management, I believe, to reconsider the business they are in from an outside-in perspective. And if you're fortunate that your management is looking at that in that particular way, or is willing to look in that particular way, as a CI professional, you've got the best job in your life. And if they don't, you better take Roland's choice and move on to a company that has, in, say, vision in their top management. That's an interesting point, of course. And we have a question from our audience, which is exactly where should you position in a kind of organizational uh, or chart exercise SCI function then? Where can you have the impact to make, you make this point about management in Rochester, not really, well, understanding maybe the market from the same perspective as you did. So how can you make this, how can you become this agent of change and, change and where should you position your CI guys and how should you operate, how should you function even? Any ideas well, about my, this? My question, to, my question to the audience would be, where do you believe is the ideal position for a court jester? Because you're the only one that is supposed to make jokes about the king, provided the jokes you make on yourself are always harsher than the one you make on the king. Excellent. So the court jester can be in strategy, the court jester can be maybe in a corporate affairs function, the court jester may even be an individual without really, say, a lot of lines, with at least access to senior management to listen to. 
I've seen the court jester being positioned in several roles, but I hardly seen anyone that took himself too serious as a CI professional being a court jester for long. So you have to accept that you're sometimes speaking truth to power. And if you want to speak truth to power, you better be very realistic on your own impact on power but, and, and make jokes about the fact that your analysis may not materialize, but yet, that you want to trigger your management to think. And if they don't want to think, they better fire you because then you're wasting your time at this. But, but so, so to me, there are different options to position a court jester. But the real key to success to me is that the court jester understands that speaking truth to power is rarely popular. But sometimes some managements accept that it's, uh, it has to be done. And those managements are the ones you'd love to serve most. Absolutely. I can just confirm what you said. Um, and I, I once again think today uh, we have a, a lot of uh, management, you know, really the, the, the top level uh, that understands that they need this, uh, this nurturing. Um, CI can provide uh, the data, you know, the objectives, the, 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 the fact, uh, what our competitors do, um, and, and then, you know, be more convincing. You know, be more uh, convincing also, even if it's, um, well, counter to the intuition or counter to what you're in. You know, I, I mean, yep. turning a meat business into a vegetarian um, is, is really a challenge. So. <laughs> but, but, I mean, this is kind of a bit, <laughs> if I dare say, Eric, a bit of a kind of a weak answer, because obviously we're living in a world, in a corporation, we have this kind of clowns and jesters around, but still doesn't mean it can't be successful. And even, let's say, this Kodak example was picked because it was a kind of easy, even, revolution, i.e. Um, kind of erosion over time. But by now we're living, hey, hey, here we come, the next slide, obviously, in an area where we have far more impacts, environmental impacts, and of course the way we operate as companies, as uh, consumers, and of course the way we compete is rapidly changing. So we'll not have this luxury almost of 30, 20 years where we can adopt and then try to survive. Let me pick one slide, very quick one, of one of these, let's call them mega trends, i.e. a slow one. But we all know it's coming. We see it coming. We have a lot of information about that. Take China Silk Road and their idea of reorganizing their trade, their network, of here macroeconomics, i.e. countries. And as you know, it's already on its way. We all see it every now and then, and it's a real strategic project. I'm not talking about politics, whether it's good or bad. My simple message is, this is a an impact where all, let's say, us Western companies, European companies at least, will have to live with and through foreign direct investment, competitors coming to your market, strategic harbors, strategic trading platforms all on the way. And again, it's not about good or bad, it's simply a fact of life, I guess, that we have to acknowledge there is a tremendous change in the way we operate and work and the way we have to check out our competitors, I guess. Let's add another trend to this as an example here. Yes, we're living in the age of digitalization. Oh, come on, everybody heard about that, and I guess we've all seen these wonderful pictures before, but again, what does it really mean for us when it comes to scanning our environment, helping our companies to become better, and I think this is a nice cartoon-like chart, but at least our generation, and this is now the older guys in the room, I guess we are still living in this kind of, well, over here, just point this out, well, we all know what happened in this industrial revolution, which was good, for 200 years to develop what we know by now as steam uh, engines and tracks and railroads and brick and mortars. We all seen this coming. Yes, 65 years ago, Second World War, Conrad Seuss, I guess he could be uh, held responsible for inventing the first computer. And now it's, of course, a standard thing for all of us. 25 years ago, wow, information society came up. Suddenly, of course, we had a lot of information, and thank you, you mentioned that already before. And now, only five years ago, maybe, we are talking about the artificial intelligence age, i.e. completely new ways of 
connecting information, making something out of that. And boom, suddenly you're running into complete new environments. How can CI and should CI obviously MI our function help companies to go through this completely different environment when it comes to positioning, products, consumer behaviors, and yes, competition. But what is your take on that? Let's play a little bit into this notion of strategic foresight that obviously we have to develop somehow. What do you see as kind of tools, techniques, approaches even from your end and from your industry's perspective? Well, I, I think uh, the, the nice thing still is that uh, uh, diffusion um, of um, and penetration of the new technology into the market is still the 25, 30 uh, years lifespan. Um, I did I did AI in the 90s. We, we worked on sun machines, did neural nets. Um, I was at that time in the US in, in, in Portland, Oregon, where Synapse did the first hardware uh, to do it. Uh, today, we are in, in uh, the well, popular cycle, you know, so it's, it's 25 years um, until uh, this, this penetrated. And I think the age of AI, you know, is just beginning and it will span a lot longer than um, the five years you just uh, uh, mentioned. I, I think um, to really implement that, you know, there are the, the two problems with that. Um, and, and the biggest problem really being uh, the processes. And anybody who, who wanted to change processes, you know, did, uh, knows how, how difficult that is in your company. We now do have the technologies in general, but the application is still also different, uh, difficult. And um, so what does that mean for CI? I mean, you, you uh, now do have um, the better access, lower price point technology to a better understand what's going on and, and where, you know, where are the applications of AI, where are, um, where are successful applications, where, where did it fail. And that helps you um, have a better, um, um, you, you know, evaluation of what is working, what is not working, uh, and what project should we support and what should we not support. So CI can, can really give you a, a big boon uh, to uh, um, guiding the money, to um, making better investments, and um, to uh, make more accurate foresight. And, and can you indicate some tools, techniques, and again, role for the CI department, given that we are well, approaching this age? I mean, you're into software, right? You know a lot of tools yeah. around. And, and oh, oh yeah. Tools. I mean, when you, when you uh, look at um, you know, the, the uh, software, for, for example, um, Eric mentioned crawlers, you know. You can now order crawlers and, and they, to individualize and, and search together what you, what you want, as, just as before the alerts, the alerts are still there. But now you have additional um, uh, possibilities to use technology to specifically cater to your needs uh, for information, you know, and, and uh, th that's, can I mention the company? For example, in Karlsruhe, uh, Ecobot, you know, uh, for, for lead generation. Cool. Um, yeah, they have the crawlers. They, they uh, can can uh, immediately, you know, have the current, the uh, most current information about uh, the leads, their telephone numbers, and so on, because they continuously uh, have the crawl, just like like what what Google does with their crawlers or, or Bing does with their crawlers for their search engine. So that's the technology that allows it to be most current, basically up to, well, not, not really real time, probably a day uh, um, uh, delay, but that's cool. You know, that's basically nearly real time. All right, so it's a bit of a speed up thing and we can process more and more information, but it's still the same function to provoke your, your uh, statement here. I think it's, it's three things we need. We need the technology, to support the scouts of the technology, you know, or of the trends of the developments. Uh, then we need the social engineers, just like Eric uh, said, I mean, there, there needs to be this acceptance uh, that maybe my business is challenged. And that needs a, a, a certain mental attitude by, by the decision makers. And third, uh, you need the implementers, and there you need the technologists, you know, because without uh, um, a proper crawler, 
you simply don't get the information. So there are three things I see. The, the, you need the scouts, you need the, the scouts and technology, you need the social engineers, and you need the implementers. All right. Let, let's uh, try to predict a little bit what our work environment will be like in the near future. So now we've talked about this kind of, remember, you're gaining this uh, productivity advantage, let's say, but you're still living in an environment. So here's a nice slide that I uh, was allowed to use from a presentation only two years, two days ago, actually, from a Siemens uh, corporate uh, lady. And of course, this is a slide that's uh, usually available from now on. So the, the big issue is this digitalization is really a change to the whole structure of companies, respectively markets. So it's not just if, if the you, information bit, but obviously there's a lot of... If you reread, uh, uh, Reiner, if you reread the book that Thomas Friedman wrote about a decade ago, The World is Flat, there's many elements in this slide that in this book that was, I think, first issued in 2006 or 2007, had been identified that by that moment in time as the, say, way that a lot of things would go forward. And indeed, now looking back, uh, rereading re the book and looking back over the past decade, a lot of those things have moved forward where they made sense. Think of offshoring of, say, all kinds of service functions where, that he described as innovative a decade ago. Those things are now common practice where they made sense. And there's been a lot of CI and MI offerings through offshoring to other parts of the world, say Bangalore or, 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 or um, Mumbai or what have you. And those things did not always make sense because they just could find the data that you could also find, but they couldn't make the switch to making it a compelling story to your management for the simple reason that they didn't really understand the market you were in. So offshoring, in some cases, made sense. And that's where it happened. And in other cases, it didn't. And that's where it didn't happen. So yeah, you, you see to, things to, changing. To, and for the CI function, sometimes it made, it made sense. And it happened. And sometimes you go through the learning curve, you discover that you don't have an economic benefit. And you don't do it anymore. Again, my point, and again, I try to provoke you a little bit, we, what we just said is a bit of a luxury problem, right? We, we can simply wait, trial and error, see what's working, and we're done. But given now the mega trends, and I try to stimulate a little bit this Chinese uh, Silk Road idea and this ongoing digitalization, which is, by the way, triggering our consumers sooner or later to change the way they shop, the way they develop preferences, the way we can predict their preferences. So how will CIMI survive to get really to the next productivity level? And now again, what is your best practice idea? How do you provide for your company, Eric, now in your case, a strategic foresight that is not only like Jasper telling the king what's good or bad, but really having an impact? You have only a few years, if this scenario is correct, to really change a company and the way it's operating. So. Come on, give me some ideas if, here. If you, if you consider China, uh, China is a magic example of change in, uh, on, in a tremendously short period of time. An incredibly large number of people have been lifted from, say, destitute, poverty situation to a situation of middle class income, which is, a, which is an incredible story. We uh, have been present in China as a company for many, many decades. The real switch came just about a decade ago, and a decade ago, we realized 0.2% of our global sales in China. Today, we realized 10, which means we, we had a tremendous growth story uh, in China, and uh, we already used the, the One Belt Railway to supply say, goods from the Netherlands to China, and it works perfectly all right. But one of the key reasons why we were, um, say, uh, realizing such growth figures was because we identified that if we would use the traditional way of market entry through classical retail in China, we were too late with some categories. So we started off as a pioneer in those days, about a decade ago, with e-sales. And e-commerce sales today have proven to be the right way forward. 
we identified, we could connect better with our consumers because the consumers we aim to connect to were those that indeed were looking at the internet as a source for, say, their nutritional information, <coughs> and therefore they were open to a Western company sharing open, say, uh, openly, directly, um, say, facts with doctors, etc., to provide the right nutritional knowledge to the doctors that we then communicated to the, uh, the consumers, and that worked magically for us. So it was the fact that we, as a late entrant into the Chinese consumer market in some categories, but with a new channel, still had a very good uh, way forward. And I believe SCI, for instance, you have to be realistic, and that's, that's still a little bit the core gesture of who you are when you start, and then say either you do something fundamentally different that matches future consumer needs, looking at trends and evaluating how you can make these trends work for you, or you wonder whether it's worthwhile competing in the market in the first place. But again, back to my point, will it change now talking about the future? This was a little bit of a successful war story. Yes, thank you. But 10 years down the road, are you talking now 2025, 27, whatever, will it still be the same foot market as per today? Will you still have the same 10% of revenues in China because we've been smart enough how to enter? Or do you envision a completely new market competitive arena, different competitors of course, and by the way, the way you distribute, you grow your cows and you, um, again, organize your own company. What do you see on this kind of future perspective here? Channels will change. Consumer needs are changing rapidly. We believe identifying the, the leading consumer needs changes early will enable us more than other companies and hopefully much better than our competition to uh, say have the offerings that are appealing to the future consumer rather than to today's consumer. And, and be together with the future consumer leading the market into new, say, uh, hygiene factors that today may be differentiated, but in the future may be hygiene factors. So the number of competitors that can meet those hygiene factors ideally is smaller than the ones that meet them today, if only because it, it will be more complicated to win a consumer's heart and mind in the future than it is today. Because consumers are becoming more sophisticated. And the, the key trick is to really understand what the future consumer need is and to invest your resources behind the number of those needs that fit where you start today and where you stand today and where you can build on today. And then develop that growth story and make sure you get the resources going to, um, to deliver it. Okay, maybe you want you want to sort of comment on this future of uh, perspective. I understand um, Eric's point. Of course, I'm trying still to provoke a little bit of this notion of CI. MI has to become more productive. Well, I, I think on the run. So, how do you make this happen? What is the change? What is the kind of jobs you're doing five, ten years down the road? I think it's a good example of what you uh, showed is that. Determination of management uh, was key to jumping in, and CI can provide um, the the, uh, the the proof or the the the, um, the assertion that uh, it's not worthwhile. We can now win, and and then once uh, uh, you know, well, there's a, that this chance. Then you need those implementers and those deciders that say. I'm now jumping in. And the difference between us or our governments and the Chinese one is once they see the possibility, they jump in and are not hesitating, but saying, um, you know, we wait for a while until we know what to do, but then we jump in. And that's actually what the CI, I think, in the future um, has to provide, you know, to, to um, even um, have a, a, a clearer um, probably layout of uh, what information do I have to provide in order for management to be able to jump in, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to, to make the decision and, and, and be determined uh, about this. So now, the change of environment, I think it's, it's more an evolutionary thing. I, I don't think that we see 
a, a revolution in that way, uh, how CI from, from today's point, you know, will work in the future. Uh, there will be things like uh, technology, for example, when you look at, at Slack, you know, being hindered basically by by uh, uh, data security and these kind of things, which has experienced some of the problems there. So that the, the uh, I think that's more an evolution. I, I don't see the revolution, even with the integration of AI. You know, I don't think AI is the revolution, but but not how we 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 integrate it or work with it. I think the revolution has rather to 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 be how does management and what does management take to jump into the right thing to do, you know, and, and that's probably where the bigger problem is. Yeah, I agree, and, and, and this is pretty much the end of our discussion for today, I guess, because this is exactly where we need to design our now being sort of as somebody in the discipline of CIMI, where we need to design what we're doing, how we do it, how we operate, and of course tools and techniques. So there's a definitely new stuff coming up, not from our discipline necessarily, but it's like scouting, right, for new ways of um, data collection, of empowering our peers, our own colleagues, as well as our suppliers and as well as our consumers to help us to understand what markets are all about. And this is definitely a completely new generation of what's coming up to the market, right, to our CI and uh, in my market. Yeah, we're pretty much into 45 minutes. I've tried to answer some questions. <laughs> That came up during the chat. Um, it's an uh, ongoing debate. I fully have to agree, and of course, uh, let me show you this little slide here. Um, if you want to continue this discussion, of course, uh, places like our conference where we obviously invite speakers to present their new ideas, their new tools, techniques are always worthwhile checking out. And that's why I usually get my kind of inputs and. Uh, impulses for how to teach, educate, train people and be prepared for the future. And this is not an easy answer. So sorry for provoking you guys. You had a pretty, pretty tough uh, discussion with me, I guess, because it's difficult to see what's next on this kind of area of uh, digitalization and impact of all these environmental forces. But yeah, we're on our way. So um, thank you very much for everybody attending our conference call, our webinar. Here's a bit of an um, overview, what's next. The very session is uh, recorded, so it will be available on our Insight Center soon. Uh, there's more obviously training programs from the ICI, Chicago, London, Barcelona coming up. And as I mentioned before, in some two days, uh, two weeks, we all meet again in uh, Bad Nauheim, by the way, uh, our two guys from this session will be there as well. So there's a good idea how to continue our um, discussion. Yeah, Eric and uh, Roland, thank you very much for uh, being on this call and, and uh, sharing your insight. Uh, hopefully everybody has a lot of uh, food for thought now and think about where you are on this slope and how you will get to the next level. Okay, enjoy your Fridays, enjoy your weekends, wherever you are, and talk to you hopefully soon. Bye-bye.